Hallelujah. I bless you, Father. When I stood on the shoreline, I was standing between a rock and a hard place. I looked behind me to see the army of the Pharaoh bringing destruction, devastation. Oh, so I looked ahead of me. Oh, Kurabosha, there was nothing but the sea. Oh, that's when I realized all else had failed. When all else fails, when all else fails, we cry to you. Oh, you are our destiny. When all else fails, when all else fails, we cry to you. Oh God, you are our destiny. So we call on the name of Jesus. Oh. We call on the name of Jesus when all else fails. When all else fails. Will you call on the name of Jesus? Hey! Will you call on the name of Jesus when all else fails? When all else fails. Oh, Yerabash. When all else fails, when all else fails, we cry to you. You are our destiny. Will you call on the name of Jesus? No. Oh, will you call on the name of Jesus when all else fails? When all else fails. Come on. When all else fails. When all else fails, we cry to you. Oh, you are, you are our destiny. Oh, Father, you are our destiny. You are our destiny. You are our destiny. Oh, Jesus, you are our destiny. Oh, Yerebushanda, you are our destiny. Jesus, you are our destiny when all else fails. When all else fails. The Bible in Second Chronicles talks about King Jehoshaphat. And it says, When the brothers of Israel, Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir, came to do battle, they cried, Jehoshaphat, a multitude comes against you. <laughs> so what did Jehoshaphat do? Come on. Jehoshaphat, well, he holds on to the altar, and the Bible says, So he cried out in fear, Koboshan, we have no power and no might. That's when Jehoshaphat, he realized all else had failed, when all else fails, when all else fails. We cry to you, you are our destiny, when all else fails, when all else fails, we cry to you, oh, Jesus, you are our destiny. So we call on the name of Jesus. Oh, Karabashan Labahat. 
Would you call on the name of Jesus? Oh, would you call on the name of Yeshua when all else fails? When all else fails, when all else fails, we cry to you. Hey, Jesus, you are our destiny now listen to what god says by the way this is a song that i wrote god gave it to me the music the lyrics the whole thing in one of uh the seasons in my life where things were just bleak <laughs> when when it felt like i was really standing between a rock and a hard place you know and so so hear what god says so Jehovah, he answered, why do you cry in fear? Come on, move forward, I am with you. Come on, declare that today. Because our God, he says, for the battle is the Lord's commotion, and this enemy is no more. Stand still and see my salvation When all else fails When all else fails Will you cry to me? Will you let me be your salvation? When all else fails When all else fails Oh, come on. Our God, he says Come cry to me, hey, I am your destiny, I am your destiny. We bless you, Holy Ghost, we bless you, Father, we magnify your name, we give you glory, we give you praise, we give you adoration, I welcome you in this place, mighty God, I welcome you in this place, Holy Father. Holy Spirit, let your spirit permeate this atmosphere. I bind up the spirit of heaviness, and I ask that you will confer upon these, your sons, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that heaviness may be lifted off their lives, and it may float away. In the name of Jesus. Jesus. You said that where two or more are gathered, there you are in the midst of us. Come on. And so I know that you are here. And I know that you will wipe away every tear. Help us to continue to hang on. Help us to continue to persevere in the day of our tribulation, knowing that we shall receive that crown that you have promised us. In your mighty name knowing that you will give us your new name Holy Spirit strengthen us with might in the inner man so that our faith shall not fail in your name I pray hallelujah well good morning and welcome to today's broadcast I am yours truly Apostle Mary Gibbs and as always it is a pleasure to be here I enjoy preaching and I thank God <laughs> for giving me that calling because it truly is fulfilling. You know, um, I am somebody who struggled a lot with low self-worth, um, low self-esteem, self-image issues, insecurities of every kind. If there was a known fear or anxiety-based disorder, I probably had it, right? <laughs> right, and so, and so I, I struggled a lot with a doubt, especially in the area of my calling, because many times I um, would, I would, um, I would associate with people that um, echoed the feelings I had about myself and so I very rarely drew into my life people that were able to see beyond where I was and so when God would speak to me I would struggle come on and I'm preaching already next week's message <laughs> come on 
um, next week and um, for the next few weeks I want to I had begun I think last year actually a series on um, emotional health and emotional well-being and I think after we're done with today's service I will start God willing um, um, a new I guess shift focuses to emotional well-being because um, emotional well-being that is one of the things that God has given to us as a gift that is one of the things that we can attain when we are in Christ and it's important for us as a body of Christ to to understand it and to embrace it to know that you know what because you're born again doesn't mean that you're not going to deal with the mental health issues but that if you do or if you are dealing with mental health issues um, that Jesus Christ through the word of God has already provided healing right anyway and so I, I struggled a lot with my calling and the things that God would say to me who I was what I was but what I began to realize was that um, I began to notice that when I would preach and I would feel in my seasons where I would feel heavy depressed when I would put on my own messages, I noticed that there was such an anointing on them that that spirit of heaviness would begin to break off of my life and I would feel freedom. And I thought to myself, I said, you know what? The, 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 the proof is in the pudding, right? That in the pudding, that, that God truly did anoint me, you know? And that this 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 calling I have is not a figment of my imagination it is not uh, something I called myself to because definitely I could not anoint myself with the anointing of the Lord God he would have to do that he would have to confirm me and what better testimony is there than for me to be able to say of myself oh girl 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 you are anointed <laughs> right it's not to be my own horn it is just recognizing the availability of the power of the anointing that is upon my life and I thank God for it because if I cannot be encouraged by the messages that the Holy Spirit speaks through me then come on what what are what are we really doing here and so I bless God for me <laughs> I bless God for the anointing on my life I bless God for his love his love is, is so pure, it's so sweet, it's so abounding, it's so limitless. And, and I bless the Father for that. So Holy Ghost, give us eyes to see this day, ears to hear, a heart that is not hard, but one that has been circumcised, that is able to receive all that you have for us in this very hour. In Jesus' name. I pray hallelujah well welcome my brethren all right today I am preaching a message and I announced this last week while I was preaching the message last week I announced that today I would be preaching the message what the glory looks like and that indeed is what I am preaching on what the glory looks like all right let's get started I'm always reading from the New King James Version of the Bible so we're going to two main scriptures today, Exodus 33, verses 18 to 23, and Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. Again, Exodus 33, verses 18 through 23, and Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7. And the Bible reads in Exodus 33, uh, verses 18 to 23, it reads, And Moses said to God, Please show me your glory. Come on, your glory. Then God said, God replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But God said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft 
of the rock and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. All right, come on, let's move to Exodus 34 verses 5 through 7. Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there. And the Lord, he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before Moses and the Lord proclaimed, right? He says of himself, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Verse seven, keeping mercies for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Kobusha, hallelujah. What the glory looks like. Last week, I preached a message that came out of John 11, and that message was entitled, Lord, if you had been here, it would not have died. And there we talked about the story of John, uh, sorry, the story of Lazarus, whom the Bible says that Jesus loved. The Bible told us in John 11 that although Jesus loved Lazarus, he allowed Lazarus to die for one reason and one reason alone, so that he might reveal his glory to them whom he loved. I said last week that, you see, there is nothing that happens in your life that God did not know about. <laughs> I said to you that God is not caught unawares by anything that happens in your life. So when, sudden, when something happens to you that looks like it is a suddenly, it only appears to you that way. It does not appear to God that way. Because before one day of our lives was set in motion, God had already seen it from beginning to end. Come on. The Bible says that Jesus had a plan. There's this song, and I forget his name. The man who sings it. I think he's a pastor now, but I don't want to say the wrong thing. But it, he, he sings this song, and this is, many, this is close to 20 years ago. He sings this song about Lazarus, right? And he says, um, and he talks about how when Lazarus dies, and it says, But Jesus had a plan unknown to any man To come and take away their pain, Lazarus Oh, Lazarus, oh, Lazarus, come forth. And again, I forget who sings it, right? But, but the point of, this, of his song was this, just like we saw in John 11, that in our lives, when God allows us to experience a Lazarus, when God allows that it, that Lazarus in our lives to die, that thing that we were certain of that would not die, God does it because of one reason and one reason alone, to show us his glory, right? And so when we read John 11 last week, that's what Jesus said. Jesus says, listen, I'm not going to go because Lazarus is sick. I'm going to let him die because I want them to experience my glory. But what we have failed to understand, folks, is this. That the glory of God cannot be obtained by just anyone. The glory of God is not some cheap thing that you can, you can, you can obtain by doing tricks. You know, by paying money for. 
God is extremely selective, extremely selective as far as who would receive his glory, right? He doesn't just give his glory to anyone. The Bible says, Jesus says in, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, I want to say, he says, do not give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Why? Because they will trample your good thing under their feet and turn around and tear you in pieces. So in the same vein, God cannot give the precious thing, the glory, to those who are undeserving. But you see, the glory is very costly. Before the glory can show up, sorrow must precede it. And that's the part that we don't understand. That's the part that we don't get. And this is why Jesus says, listen, this sorrow, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. In the book of John, chapter 16, verses 20 to 21, Jesus tells the disciples before he's about to leave, he says, listen, you're going to have sorrow. You're going to lament and you're going to be grieved. He says, but your sorrow will turn to joy. Your, the glory of God cannot be manifested except you had walked through a valley of sorrow first. You cannot attain to the mountain of God if you don't first go through the valley. In God, the way up is down. Come on. Which is why the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, I believe that before elevation or honor is to be cast down or humility. God gives the glory only to those whom he loves. <laughs> Do you get that? Yeah. But it also means that those whom he loves will also be wounded. They will also experience a deep sorrow and anguish of soul before they can know his glory. One thing we understand from this scripture when Moses says to God, show me your glory. Why didn't God just say, um, okay, I'll just manifest stuff. No, God says, for you to experience my glory, there must be a proximity, right? We must be in close proximity to each other. You have to be physically close to me. Come on. Right? And this is why he says, okay. And so if you're going to be physically close to me, there is a risk of you perishing, <laughs> right? Because anyone who, uh, who, who has access to my glory is not permitted to see my face and live. And so that's what all the fire is about that has been in your life because God himself is fire. He's a consuming fire. And I said this a few weeks ago. I said, listen, you cannot be in a relationship with a fire unless you yourself become as fire or you yourself have garments that are fire retardant or fire resistant, meaning that when you are tossed into the fire, you don't burn. <laughs> And the only way that you can be tossed into the fire and not burn is that you yourself are fire. That's it. Because eventually your flame retardant or flame resistant uh, 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 apparel will give out. So the only way that you would not burn when you approach fire or enter into fire is that you yourself have become a flame. Come on. And so the glory is not for anyone. And so those that are eligible for the glory's manifestation in their lives are those who have already themselves experienced fire. Apostle Peter calls it that 
that that strange thing that happens to you, that fiery trial that happens to you, that appears to you like a strange thing. You know, you stand and you look at your life and you say, no, 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 this cannot actually be happening to me. Right? I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? It's the crucifixion. You, you say, no, no. We know that the mother of James and John, um, the sons of Zebedee, had come to Jesus Christ before his ascension and said to him, they said, Lord, the mom says, she comes to Christ and she bows down to him. He says, what is it? What, what can I do for you? And she says, well, I'm asking that you will allow my sons, James and John, to sit at your right hand. And God and Jesus says, excuse me, do you know what you're asking? He's like, I cannot give you that, I said. He says, only God determines who sits at his right and his left. I definitely can't give you that. And he says, and do you even know what you're asking? You want to sit in the place of the glory, but can you drink from the cup that the glory requires, that cup of suffering? He says, can you drink from the chalice of crucifixion? And James and John, they said, yes, we can. And he says, indeed, you will drink from it, right? Because any person who is my disciple must drink from the chalice of affliction. There, there's no way around that. He says, but to determine, but to give you a seat to my right and my left, that I cannot do. Only God, the Father, can do that. Right? The glory. The glory is God's manifested power. His good things, his endowment, his manifest presence. That's what the glory is. And when the glory hits your life, the miraculous follows it. <laughs> things that deemed impossible all of a sudden become possible for you. That's what the glory does. <clears throat> the glory cannot manifest without an introduction by sorrow. The anguish of your soul is the thing that lets you know the glory will manifest in your life. Right? It's just not an anguish of your soul. It's you persevering through the anguish of your soul. You holding fast to your faith. That's what we're talking about. And that's why in John 11, Jesus says to John 11, verse 40, Jesus says to, uh, um, to Martha, he says, Martha, have I not told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Right, because, you know, at this point, uh, Jesus was about to go and open the tomb. Uh, sorry, Jesus had asked that the tomb be opened where Lazarus was laid. And, and Martha says, no, God, he's been, he's, he's been dead for four days. He's going to be smelling by now. I mean, and he's, you know, because in her mind, she's like, He's too far gone. You know, she's like, we're not talking about somebody who's in the morgue. We're talking about, some, we're, we're not talking about somebody who hasn't been embalmed. We're talking about somebody who's been embalmed, who's been buried and has been buried for a while. And Jesus says, yes, I understand. But you see, he says, when the glory of God is manifested, nothing is impossible at that point. Right? The laws of physics seem to cease to exist. <laughs> right? Yeah. The laws of nature don't work anymore when the glory is present. And we have to now be willing to come to the place to believe that God wants to give us the glory. That what waits for us after all the sorrow provided that we persevere and we believe is God's glory. But what does that glory look like? In Exodus 33, verse 18, when Moses says, God, show me your glory. That word glory there is the Hebrew word kabod, which means abundance and honor right and so there are four things four parts 
that God reveals to Moses about what the glory is. The glory is God's goodness. The glory is the revelation of his name. This is why God says in verse 19, Exodus 33 verse 19, he says, Then God says, I will make all my goodness, which is all my good things, anything that is abundantly good. He says, I will make that pass before you, number one. Number two, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will proclaim my identity. I said to you last week, I said, you see, when the glory shows up, it reveals the identity, the names of God to you, the name of God that you had not known him by, right? That's what the glory brings. It brings a proclamation of God's name. So you get to see another side of God. You get to see another name of God that you have not known God by before. So it says, I will proclaim my name. Number three, what the glory brings. I will be gracious. Gracious is the, the Hebrew word shanon, which means shanan, which means favor and kindness, right? So the glory consists of God's goodness, his identity, shanon, which is graciousness, favor and kindness. Right? He says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And compassion there is also the Hebrew word rakam, which is to have love, to have pity, and to have mercy. And God says, this is what my glory looks like. It's goodness, an abundance of things. It's the revelation of who I am, my identity, you getting to know me, you getting to have an intimate experience of me. It is my favor and my kindness, and it is my pity, my love, and my mercy. Those are the four parts, the four elements. And so God begins, and the Bible says, when we get to Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7, the Bible says, so God does this. He puts Moses in the cleft of the rock and God begins to declare who he is. God begins to declare who he is. And there are seven names that God calls himself to Moses or calls himself or reveals to Moses about himself. And when the glory appears in your life, you will experience these seven aspects of God. The first one is Exodus 34, verse 7, it says, uh, verse 6, it says, And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, which is Yahweh, which is I am or to become right I am I am that is his name it means that whatever you can imagine me to be I can become that I am means to exist or to become to just to be this is why the Bible says because God is I am this is why the Bible says God calls the things that are not as though they were and they become why because God himself is Whatever God says, it becomes. Your situation turns around when God says, turn around. When there's death in your life and God says, come forth, Lazarus, it must respond. Come on. There is nothing in your life that will not turn around when I am shows up. All you've got to do is wait for the re revealing of I am, the first name, I am. He says, then the next name he reveals himself is the Lord God, which is El, which means almighty. El means the mighty one, the warrior. Come on, right? The one that will fight the battles. We saw this in the book of Exodus chapter 14. When the children of Israel were at the, uh, what's that place? The, the Red Sea. And Moses says to them, stand still and see the salvation of God. 
Stand still and see my salvation. He says, this Pharaoh you see today, you will see no more. And what does God do? All of a sudden, the laws of physics are suspended, <laughs> right? Because the waters part open. God says part, and they say, okay. <laughs> they say, how high, God, how high? And that's what they did. And so the children of Israel would walk through defying the laws of physics that should not be able to happen but when the almighty God shows up in your situation <laughs> it tells the laws of physics to go take a break and it must respond <laughs> right he says I am the Lord God El I am Elohim I am the almighty God El the third name that God reveals about himself, he says, I am merciful. And I said already that word is to show compassion, to show pity. He says, I am gr gracious, which is to show a person favor and kindness. He says, I am long suffering which means I am slow to anger hmm. when the glory shows up in your life it's not that God excuses the bad things or silly things you do by the time the glory shows up I mean you've you pretty much look like God yourself so at this point we're not talking about sin anymore but you might still make mistakes. And the Bible says that God will be long-suffering with you. But God is always long-suffering, though. Many times I look at our world and I look at people who have allowed the devil to use them. And I say, you know, <laughs> people who are wicked. And I say of God, I'm like, why are you taking this long to avenge us? I mean, really. But the point is that God is a long suffering. He bears long. He is not quick to get angry like we are. Well, let me talk about my own self. Right? And so he is slow to anger. It takes a lot for God to finally say, okay, okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. It takes a lot. So human beings cannot say, oh, I wasn't given a chance. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, yes, you did know. And yes, I, I let you do whatever you wanted to do. Yeah, you know? So God is slow to anger. Right? Uh, that's the fifth name. The next name, the sixth name, or identity by which God reveals himself, he says, he says, God is abounding in goodness. Which means God is very, 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 very good. He abounds in goodness. And so when that glory is in your life, you see goodness. And I know it's difficult to wrap our minds around because, you know, especially when you've been suffering for a long time. When you've been suffering for a long time and... Um, and um and and you begin to think about yourself being a beneficiary of the glory you say no i've lived in hades for so long i've lived in the equivalent of hell for so long i've suffered for so long i cannot imagine a life where i will know god's goodness but when the glory shows up it brings with it the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. Oh, and all my life you have been so, so good. Oh, with every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. Oh, all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
God, your love is running after, it's running after me. Your love is running after, it's running after me. God is good, I mean really. And when we are able to taste that goodness, when we are able to experience it, it takes us to a place that is the equivalent of paradise. But many of us don't get to get to that place because we become apostates on the way there. We get to a place where the suffering seems to outweigh the glory, receiving the glory as a prize and we say, I'm sorry, I just can't. We saw it happen in the life of um, Job before the glory was going to be revealed, God's goodness, His abundance, before that was going to be revealed in, 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 in Job's life, I mean, things, things were ho horrific. And, and Job's wife, he, she said, listen, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, why don't you just, you know, renounce your faith so that we can move on with our lives? What kind of God would allow this type of devastation in our lives? But when the glory is going to come, when the goodness is going to abound in your life, what precedes it is pain. And I don't know why God does things that way. I honestly don't. I mean, the Bible says in Isaiah 55 that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He doesn't do things the way we do. He operates in a kingdom that is completely different from the way that this kingdom, the kingdom of mankind, operates. And so, why God does things the way God does, only God knows. But before the glory, before the goodness must, must, must come the anguish of spirit, the anguish of soul. And that's what Job experienced. But the Bible tells us in James 5 that we saw the graciousness of God, the goodness of God, God's mercy, His compassion. There are days that I have cried some tears that... And sometimes the things you experience are so horrific is that you can't actually repeat it. I mean, because nobody would believe you. <laughs> and also because you, you just, you don't want to relive, relive, you don't want to relive that emotional pain. And so it's better to just be quiet and not even talk about it. You know, perhaps the pain will subside somehow, you know. And the final main identity that God reveals to Moses, he says, and I am that God who abounds in truth. Right? Hebrew word emeth, which means, which is coined from the root word aban, meaning to confirm or support truth. Em em emeth connotes reliability, sureness or certainty. Stability, continuance, and faithfulness. That is what truth means. It means that when the glory shows up in your life, you're not ever going to have to wonder again about God's faithfulness, about His goodness, about whether or not He's with you. You will have a being, an entity that you can put all your trust in knowing that this person, this he's not a person, knowing that this personality or this persona will never let you down. That you have found some anchor for your soul that is not ever going to fail. The glory brings the assurance of God's presence, God's support of you, God's approval, God's acceptance of you, truth. He says, I am abounding in truth. That's what the glory looks like.
you get to see the seven identities of God. In the glory, you experience His identities. All things become new. And what seemed like an impossible thing, all of a sudden, is no longer impossible. Your love is running after, it's running after me. Your love is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. Oh, oh, oh. And all my life you have been so, so good. Oh, with Your goodness is running after, it's running after us. Oh, your goodness is running after, it's running after us. And all my life you have been faithful. Oh, oh. I bless you, God. I bless you, God. And all our lives you have been faithful. Oh. And all our lives you have been so, so good. Yeah, yeah. With every breath, every breath. That I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness, of the goodness of God. Yes, I will. His goodness is coming after. It's coming after you. Oh, His goodness is coming after. It's coming after me. His goodness is coming after. It's coming after us. It's coming after. It's coming after us. His goodness is coming after. It's coming after us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.
Father, I thank you that these will be able to receive your glory. That they will see your glory, God. That they will see your glory in Jesus' name. Perhaps you don't know Jesus Christ today. The Bible is very clear. Romans 10. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. It says, listen. For you to come into relationship with Jesus Christ, for you to be able to attain His glory, to know what it means by experience. It says that all you have to do is to believe that Jesus Christ, that He died for your sins, and that when He did that, He paid for it with His life. And so therefore, you no longer have sin because Jesus has cleansed it with His blood. But it also says that if you believe that in your heart, that now you must confess it, you must acknowledge it through speech. You must acknowledge it vocally. You must speak it back to God, that you know that Jesus did do this thing for you and that you want to receive it. You want to, you want to make, place a demand on the payment of that that. You want to withdraw, come on, come on, from what Jesus Christ has deposited into your spiritual bank account. The righteousness that he has given you through his blood. And so, really it's a, it's, a, it's a personal confession that you make because you believe it, not because I'm telling you to say it. Um, I remember before I really got saved, for real, Every time that a preacher would give the salvation call, like what I'm doing, I would run down to the altar and give my life. But I didn't really understand what I was saying or doing, and it was not heartfelt. I was saying it because they said, say it, but I was not actually saved. I said it, but those words didn't mean anything. And it wasn't until one day in my living room, when I really did mean it, um, you know, I was in a bad place. I was in a romantic relationship that was just not good for me. It was, and I was in a bad place, and I didn't know how to get free from that. And, and although although my father was a preacher, I didn't really have a relationship with God. I mean, we went to church, but that didn't mean anything. And so, um, so I said to God one day, I said, "Look, I don't know if you're real or not. I mean, you know, I don't know, but if you are, help me." And sure enough, a few weeks later, this televangelist comes on the TV and she gives a salvation call. And this is the first time ever in my life. This was when I was in my 20s. I was very young then. And, um, and so she gives the salvation call. And for the first time ever, a tele-evangelist or, or a person of God actually spoke to my soul and when she gave the call I knew she was talking to me I knew that this was the answer to the prayer I had made to this God whom I wasn't sure whether he existed or not but this was it and, and when I responded I was in my living room right so there was no one there but me <laughs> it was like two in the morning when this woman comes on the TV and and it was just me and God and her, and that was it. And so, but I knew. I knew by the Spirit, though I wasn't born again, I just knew she was talking to me. I knew this was God, and I said yes. And that was it. I mean, it's been me and God since then. I've had high ups and downs, high and lows. I've had moments where I said, I'm done with God, right? I've, all of that has happened in my life, so I'm not saying it's been <laughs> one beautiful bed of roses. It, isn't, it, roses. it hasn't been, but I can tell you that God has been with me since then. And so um, you can have the same relationship. And I can tell you personally that as a person who's been through a lot of trauma with people that I needed in my own life something, an anchor that would not move. I needed an anchor that I could always return to um, and knowing that everything would be okay and that is what God is to me. You know, God is not some creature in the heavenlies that cannot be approached. <laughs> you know, God is not this creator that is not, that is unapproachable. God is personally my, the thing I worship Personally, the rock on which 
um, my life is built it is him that gives me stability we all need stability we all need some place something that is immovable in our lives and I promise you I've looked high and low I've gone through and through the earth and I promise you that the only thing that I have found that can be that immovable rock is Jesus Christ there is no love there is no person there is no thing there is nothing you can attain to you that can be that unmoving force in your life except God you know I mean we are well intentioned but I, I, I want you to know that your lover can't do it your husband your wife your child your parents your siblings your job you yourself nothing that is created on this side of the universe of, of existence can be that rock that's immovable in your life and so whenever you place your trust in anything other than that immovable rock you will falter and you will get hurt trust me I'm saying from experience because though humans we are well intentioned we have a thing called human frailty and human frailty will always make us feel at least one time in our lives so human beings are not the thing that we should place our hope our trust in um god is god is and only god is that one thing that you should place your entire your entire trust in and i promise you that he does not fail let us pray if that is you today and you want this jesus in your life i want you to repeat these words after me heavenly father I come to you today asking you to be my Lord and Savior. I ask you, Father, to forgive me for every sin. Lord Jesus, Come into my life today. Lead me. Guide me. And make me your own. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, if you pray that prayer, you are officially born again. And I want to be the first to welcome you into the kingdom of heaven. Heavenly Father, you know whom these are, who have given their lives to you. And I pray that they will get to know you and your abundance and your glory and your correction. They will get to know you as Father. They will get to know you as friend. They will get to know you um, for who you truly are. Keep them, Father, from wolves in sheep clothing. Send them to a church, a Bible-based church, um, that is built on love and discipleship, where they will not be taught religion, or the rule of law or tradition but where they will be brought up in your love and admonition in jesus name i pray amen well hallelujah thank you for joining me and as always it is a pleasure like i said we are going to um, um we're pretty much done with the uh transformed series <laughs> And we are going to start talking about um, some other subjects um, in the coming weeks. Um, a lot of it will center around relationships, around emotions, things of that nature. So stay tuned. Well, it's been a pleasure. And um, until we meet again this same time next week, stay blessed, remain encouraged, and may the grace of God be with us all and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen.